The story is told that in Africa, a large number of people came to know Jesus Christ. And when they became Christians, they had this tradition, this habit that they began, that they would have this place that they would go to an isolated place away from their home. They would go through the field and over time when they went to this isolated place for a time of prayer, study, of meditation, that it would be a path that would develop. So if you can imagine this community where so many people have come to know Jesus and have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and here they each have a path that goes from their home to an isolated place of prayer. What, what a beautiful thought as you go through that. These trails became well worn. That also helped. Because if a new believer began to neglect prayer, began to neglect this time with God, then others would notice. And they would kindly go to that individual and make this statement. Brother, the grass grows on your path. I'd like for you to think about that as we begin our time together tonight. That as we look at our spiritual lives, if we looked at our devotion to God, our faithfulness, if it were this path from our home to an isolated place, and others could see that well-worn path, would that path be well-worn? Or is this a time that someone would need to come to us? Um, A loving person that would say, brother or sister, uh, brother, the grass grows on your path. Man, last week we talked about a lot of problems that we're facing, whether it's in our country, our community, or even in the church today. And what we need is we need some people that will stand up among us, godly, wise leaders who will just declare, stop. Someone that will look at us as a congregation, perhaps someone that needs to uh, talk to us individually and say, brother or sister, the grass grows on your path. Friend, I think about where we are right now. And, And just because we are not able to assemble in a building together, that does not prevent us from worship. It does not prevent us from studying our Bibles from praying, from encouraging others, from serving others. It does not do that. And so it may be very well that we have grown so attached to just this time together that it may be that someone needs to look and need to ask us, friend, is is grass growing on your path? Somebody needs to look, whether it's our society, whether it's our church, perhaps even us individually, say, stop. You know, we need leaders among us today that will help us come to our senses. That's one of the stories we looked at last week. It's from Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son who went to his father and wanted part of his inheritance. He said, give me my inheritance. He took that money and boy, he left and he had nice clothes on his back. He had money in his pocket. And buddy, he went out and as long as he had money, he had friends. But by the time we get to chapter 15, verse 15, he ran out of money and he ran out of friends. Luke 15, verse 15 tells us this important part of that story. It says, so he went out and he hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? But here I am, starving to death. You know, friends, it's not always easy to come back home. But understand this, if this story teaches us anything, It may not be easy for us to come back home, but it has nothing to do with whether God wants us back or not because God is waiting and He wants us back. Scripture teaches that in the Old Testament and in the New, that God welcomes us back. 
So the problem really comes on our end. It's the part of coming to our senses. It's the part of humbling ourselves where we're willing to go back home. Can you imagine the humility that was required for that son, that prodigal son? Man, he had left, he had left home with these good-looking clothes, and he had money in his pockets, and by the time he came back home, he didn't have either. And he had to humble himself to his father to, just to say, Man, Father, I messed up. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. That took a lot of humility. That's one of the things we talked about last week of how important it is that we be willing, if we desire to experience revival today, revival in our lives spiritually, revival in the church, but which I firmly believe can lead to our community and across our country. But it has to begin with each of us individually. Now, we looked last week at this story out of Luke 15, but we also looked at this story in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This comes at a time when David has served as king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. Those were great days for Israel. And his son Solomon ruled in a great way. Solomon was the one that was in charge of building the temple, a permanent home for God. And so that temple has been built the sacrifices for the temple have been offered, and God has made it clear that He desires to reside among His people. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. It's there the Scripture says, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from my wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. As we began to look at this passage last week, we talked about it. it Again, this was at a point, remember, this was written, things were good. But God's telling Solomon, things will not always be good. And so everybody needs to know that when we leave and rebel and disobey God, that God's not going to move. That He'll be there and He will wait for us to come back. That's where He says that the people who are called by my name. And last week we talked about the importance of humility, but of praying, of seeking His face, turn from their wicked ways. That's when God would hear, and that's when God would answer. So humility is an important part of that. Seeking God's face is an important part of that. In fact, I want us to turn to another Old Testament book. The book of Zephaniah, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let's read this passage together. Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the degree takes effect and that day passes like wind-borne chaff before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, do You who do what He commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. And so here Zephaniah is, and he's talking about the Lord's fierce anger. He's saying, it's coming. He's saying, you can can change this. Seek the Lord. Then what does he say? He says, all of you, that when you humble yourself, all of you of the nation, when you humble yourselves and you do what He commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, and then you'll be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Man, what an important passage for us. Uh, author John Ortberg talks about how society has often viewed this idea of humility and of how Scripture changes that particularly in just a moment, we'll look at 
when Jesus came and lived among us. Here's something that Ortberg says. He says, The ancient world honored many virtues, like courage and wisdom, but not humility. People were genuinely divided into first class and coach. Rank must be preserved, said Cicero. And so there was the idea of the haves and the have-nots. And so the haves, man, they, they wanted to, to have more. The have-nots continued to struggle. But this idea of humility would have been considered with the lower class. And, and what we learn from Scripture, now, man, Ortberg's just pointing to history of how history has viewed humility in times past. And even today, we can see some of that same mentality coming forth in our society. But we need to hear again the words of Scripture. We need to hear again the words of Jesus. This from John chapter 13. This comes after our Lord takes that towel and the basin and the water. And He went around and He washed His disciples' feet. Just hours before He would go to the cross, the Lord, Scripture says at the beginning of that chapter, He wanted to show them just how much He loved them. And He did so with an incredible act of humility. Then John 13 verse 15 says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. One of the many lessons that Jesus taught us while He lived among earth was the importance of humility, of considering others better than ourselves, of being willing to serve others, even others of a lower position. So man, Jesus came along and when we look at Scripture, we see how that just completely changed the idea of what the world talks about. When the world thinks of humility, the world thinks of a bad thing. When Scripture talks about humility, it talks about it as a vital trait for us to have a right relationship with God and for us to be a true leader among people, to be a people of humility. Now, we recognize that revival, an important part of revival as we look at Second Chronicles and focus our thoughts there, Important part of that is humility. But there's another lesson that we need to look at tonight. And let's let this quote from Gypsy Smith, let's let it explain this to us. He talks about the importance of prayer. Go home, lock yourself in your room, kneel down in the middle of the floor, draw a chalk mark all around yourself and ask God to start the revival inside the chalk mark. When He has answered your prayer, the revival will be on. Friends, revival begins with you. Revival begins with me. Prayer is an integral part of the Christian walk, the Christian journey. And just as we've asked tonight, is it the need for someone to come up to us and say, brother or sister, the grass grows on your path. Because if we want to be a people who experience revival in our personal life, in the church, in our community, and in our country, it has to involve humility, but it has to also involve prayer. Now for our study tonight, I'd like for us to go to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel will be in chapter 12 for a lot of our study tonight. Uh, Samuel, let's start off. Uh, Samuel played a great role as a prophet. He was the one who named Saul as the first king. Interesting thing when you look at that of how Saul would be elevated and Samuel would 
would, would take a place off to the side, really. Samuel was the one who came back, though, and he was the one that chose David as Israel's second king. Now, this had all come about because the Israelites kept saying, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. Samuel kind of took that personally. But God said, don't take it personally. It's not about you, it's about me. We'll look at that tonight. And so what we want to start with tonight is chapter 12. This is what's supposed to be Samuel's farewell speech. Interesting words. Let's look at this and then we'll dive into it. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of His great name, the Lord will not reject His people because the Lord was pleased to make you His own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for all of you. And I will teach you the way that is good and is right. Now, we want to stay, we want to focus on this idea of what Samuel is saying. At a time that basically the Israelites have said, Samuel, we're done with you. Your sons aren't any good. Uh, We want a king. He didn't take it personally. Instead, he saw the importance of being a people to pray. He said, man, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Now, just a couple of simple points that come out about this. Uh, First of all is that Samuel was a man of prayer. Now, we understand that because I really do believe that we are a people of prayer. But I wanted you to notice of, of how at times often we are drawn to the need to pray. Man, somebody's sick and what do we do? Man, we need to pray about that, right? If we find out that someone's marriage is in trouble, perhaps it's our own, what do we do? And we need to pray about that. Let there be problems in the church, and we keep talking about, we need to pray about that. We look at problems in our country now, and we are a people that are being drawn to prayer. Why is that? Because we need to pray about that. We are a people that keep talking about the need to pray. But I want to suggest to you this, and this is so important. Man, if we, you know what, understand this. Man, we need to pray during those times, whether it's sickness, whether it's a marriage issue, whether it's a problem in the church or a problem in our country. But here's the deal. If we want to experience revival, genuine revival, then we've got to be a people who return to our knees. We go in that room, we draw a chalk circle around us, and we ask God for revival. And to begin to with the person in that circle. We want to be a people who experience revival. We need to be a people who are drawn to our knees. Samuel did not offer to return to prayer. That's what I love about that passage. He didn't offer to return to prayer. He offered to continue in prayer. I think that that is a great thing. Uh, Let's look at this passage. This is in chapter 8. This is before the the first king Saul was named. Chapter 8, verses 4 through 9. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you're old. Your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king. And they have done from the day, just as they have done from the day, that I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So 
they're doing to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Man, powerful passage here. God speaking to Samuel, because this has started off with the Israelites coming to Samuel. And they said, man, you know what? You're old, your sons, they, they haven't been faithful. We want a king. Every other nation's got a king. So we need to have a king. Now, we recognize, right, that just because everybody else has something or does something doesn't make that a good idea. In case we didn't get that, that becomes real clear in this passage right here. And God is saying, man, it's not you. It's me that they have rejected. I, I love this. Look at, the verse, look at the flow here. In verse 6, when they said, give us a king to lead us, Samuel was displeased. Now what, what does that mean? Uh, displeased is a word somewhere that fits between the idea that he was upset, maybe even angry, but he was also hurt. It's hard not to take that message personally. But look how he responded. Even at a time, just to use just a plain old southern phrase, even at a point that Samuel could have gotten his feelings hurt, what did he do? He prayed to the Lord. He didn't return to prayer. He continued to pray to the Lord. Samuel had this idea that it would be wrong for him to stop praying. In fact, look what he says in verse 23. He tells the Israelites, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. I'll teach you the way that is good and right. Samuel's saying, I'm not giving up on you but he sees as an integral part of his relationship with Israel. He sees as an important, not to return to prayer, but to continue in prayer. I, I, I love what I see here. He said, it would be sinful for me if I ceased to pray. That's an interesting concept for us, isn't it? Isn't it an interesting concept for us that we think, you know, I'm just going to stop praying for them, or, or, or we let grass grow along our path? And Samuel says, it would be sinful for me to cease to pray for you. So friends, we need to see, especially right now, we need to see more than ever of the need, the opportunity, the responsibility to be in prayer to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be in prayer for our church, to be in prayer for the direction of the church. Because I can tell you this, that as we come out of this situation, one of the things that we're going to need to do is we're going to have to do a lot of evaluation about our ministry and how we will be effective in reaching this community for Jesus Christ. It will not change the truth of the message. It might, though, change of how we go about sharing that message with our community. Don't stop praying now. Do not cease to pray. If we want to experience revival, then we don't need to have praying that stops and starts and stops and starts. We do not want to cease to pray. We want to continue in prayer. But Samuel also did something else. He served. If you remember that, that phrase from verse 23 where he talked about how he would continue to teach them what is right? You see, that's important for us. We can continue to be effective in teaching. We can continue to be effective in encouraging one another. And we need to do that. So that as we go and we're talking to a brother or sister in Christ, it may be that as we look to them, as we talk to them, that we're able to identify something and to simply say, Man, brother, the grass grows on your path. We want to encourage people. Don't cease to pray. Not now. Don't cease to serve. Not now. By the way, it's interesting to watch that even at a time that you, you think that, that Samuel had retired, 
You notice how he keeps coming back in the story? Even at a point, this is an interesting story, if you go through and continue reading about Saul, that there's a point after Samuel dies, Saul's in a bind and he still goes back. And he tries to raise Samuel from the dead so he can talk to him and so that he can get advice from him. And there's some great lesson for us. Don't cease to pray. And whatever happens right now, don't, don't even consider this idea of retiring. Not spiritually. Man, God has still got something really good for us to do. And it may be that you, in your unique situation, with the wisdom and knowledge that you bring to the table, that you're going to do something that is going to help and to be a blessing for this church, not just now, but for entire generations to come. I think that that is critical. I love this. When we start talking about revival, we like to talk about plans. We like to plan a revival. We don't plan a revival, friends. We pray a revival. Listen to these words from E.M. Bounds. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men of prayer, men of prayer, Mighty in prayer. Sir George Adam Smith tells about how uh, he was on a mountain climbing trip. And they had gotten up and man, they, they were talking about you know, these big mountains, these big summits in the Swiss Alps. And it was a rough storm, but they finally made their way to the summit. But the weather was horrible. And so they got there, and they get to the very top, to the peak, to the pinnacle of that mountain, and and here Sir George, he forgets about those winds. He leaps up, and he is so excited, and he wants to claim victory, and it's about that time that the guy grabbed him and jerked him back down to the ground. And he said, On your knees, sir. You are safe here. Only on your knees. You are safe here only on your knees. Friends, do we want to see good days? Then we need to be a people of prayer. Do we want to see revival in our lives, in the church, in our community, and in the country? Then we need to be a people who return to our needs. We're not talking about the need for better programs or better this or better that or new this or new. You know what we need? We need to be a people who start with prayer, who get to our knees. See, for some of us, it really is this need to return to prayer. But once we do that, once we return and we find renewal in prayer, I plead with us this. We do not cease to pray for God to do good through us and for the church as we impact our community for Jesus Christ.